this is probably the most intense session in terms of the gravity and the seriousness of it in the whole book of Song of Solomon. So I'm going to ask the Lord to really prepare our hearts. This is my uh, favorite chapters, chapter 5 and 6 and 7. <laughs> no, <laughs> honestly, it's chapter 5, and, but it's a very intense chapter. Father, I ask you for the leadership of the Holy Spirit now. Lord, as we prepare to receive the things that I believe are on your heart, that are heavy and even weighty, but important to you. And Lord, I thank you for who you've called your church to be. And I ask you again the prayer of Paul in the, to the church of Ephesians. That you would open the eyes of our heart. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. By the spirit of revelation. It would be a supernatural opening of the eyes of the heart. That we, we, that we would see the riches of the glory of being God's inheritance. Lord, our hearts are just, we reach for that. We long to understand that. We long to enter into that reality. We ask that You would bring us into this thing called being the inheritance of Christ Jesus. Amen. God the Father committed to His Son that He would have an inheritance that would be equally yoked to Him. And in chapter 5, the issue that's at stake is that the Lord is dealing with the bride in such a way that she would become His inheritance. Her focus would no longer be just upon her inheritance, but her focus would change and she would be concerned with being the inheritance of the Lord and living like that. I mean, she was in His inheritance the day she was born again. But I mean, living like it Living like His bride now and loving like His bride now, not just waiting to get to heaven before she lived and loved like the bride. Let, let me give you a uh, kind of a quick overview of where we've been in this book. It starts off in chapter 1. In the introduction, she cries out for a kiss. She says, Father, let Your Son put His hand upon my heart And let the deepest things in God's heart be given to me. Empower me, God, to wholeheartedly give myself back to you. Let him, let me know the kisses. Let me experience the kisses of his mouth. The kiss of God touching the heart, expanding our capacity to receive from God and to give ourselves fully back to God. And she goes on in verse four. She states her life vision, which is again the theme of the song. It's her inheritance. She says, draw me and let us run. She says, I want to be an extravagant worshiper. I want to be drawn into the deep things of God by the Holy Spirit. But I also want to run in partnership with you, Lord Jesus. I want to be your mature partner. So it's a twofold life vision. Draw me and let us run. Another way of saying it, I want intimacy with you, but I want impact upon people. It's intimacy and impact. Drawing and running. Worshiping or bringing deliverance to other people. So she cries out her twofold life vision. Well, her journey begins in chapter 1, verse 5. We looked at last night. Last night seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? (laughs) She begins her journey with the first crisis. The shame of failure. A crisis that every single fervent believer experiences that crisis a number of times. The Lord lets her know the confession that she, yes, she is dark of heart. She does have weak flesh, but she's lovely to the Lord. Then He embraces her and affirms her and shows her who she is as the Rose of Sharon begins to reveal uh, her true identity to her. Then in chapter 2, verse 8, the Lord appears leaping and skipping on mountains. He appears as the Lord over all obstacles, the Lord of the nations. Nothing can hinder Him. And he invites her in verse 10. He says, rise up and come with me. Because remember, this whole thing is about you being at my side with me. And he gives her these promises to woo her. And then we know in verse 17, she turns him away. She turns him away. And the compromise that's based in fear. 
This wasn't the same thing as the shame of failure. This was the fear of being hurt. This was the fear that it wasn't safe to leave the comfort zone. It was an entirely different issue that he was confronting in her life. Then in chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, he disciplines her. Specifically in verse 1, he takes his presence from her. But remember, his discipline is like no one else's discipline. There's no anger in the discipline. When he gives correction, there's no anger in it. There's no rejection in it. And there's no abuse in it whatsoever. It's an entirely heavenly, a completely unique type of discipline. The discipline is there. He does slap the hand of his people, but only to bring his people into deeper things because of love. His embrace is there. His enjoyment of her is there. And his confidence in her is there in the midst of the correction. A totally unique style of correction. And then in chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, which we looked at this afternoon, he begins to woo her and he says again to her, chapter one, chapter 4, verse 1, you are so beautiful. He gives that double affirmation after she fails in this issue of fear, just like he gave her that double affirmation when she stumbled into the shame of her own failure. That double aff affirmation that we looked at this afternoon. Then the book really begins to pick up in chapter 4, verse 6. She says, she makes the great statement, I will go to the mountain of myrrh. Remember chapter 2, he says, come to the mountain. She said, no. He loves her. He loves her. He loves her. He loves her. She says, I will go to the mountain of myrrh. I will go all the way to the mountain. Nothing can stop me. You are a safe God. And anyone that feels this way about me when I'm weak will attend to all the issues about my life. Anyone that's this sensitive and this tender can be trusted even in the mountains and in the rough places of life. That's her conclusion. Now, chapter 4, verse 6, it's one of the great turning points of the book. By an act of her own will, voluntary love. We talked about that this afternoon. That the glory of this inheritance, the glory of this inheritance is she does it by an act of her own will, voluntarily. She sets her heart, I will go. She hasn't gone to the mountain of myrrh. She's going to do that in chapter 5. We're going to look at that in a few moments. But it's the setting of her heart that moves the heart of God. Because he knows the attainment of maturity is something he will give her grace to do. But this setting of her heart says, I want to be in full partnership with the Son of God. This is a very, very vital, very key and important part of the journey here. Verse 7, he looks at her. You are altogether beautiful, my love. He sees that she agrees to go to the mountain of myrrh. Remember, myrrh speaks of suffering. It's the burial spice. It's death to self. The whole issue of myrrh. She agrees to go to full partnership. Voluntary love in verse 6. He affirms her in verse 7. Verse 9 and 10, we see the ravished heart of God. He is so moved. He's preparing her. She has said yes to the cross in verse 6. He is embracing her and cherishing her and preparing her for the ultimate, what I call the ultimate twofold test. He is revealing how he feels about her. He says, one look of your eyes has ravished me. I am overwhelmed by the unusual beauty of your life. He sees her willing spirit. What he's doing in chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, is he says, your love is beautiful. It's better than the wine of this world. He's preparing her. He's embracing her in order to equip her to embrace the cross fully. The Lord's method isn't warnings and threatenings for the higher things of God. His method of enabling us, equipping us to embrace the cross is He embraces us. And that empowers us. We say anyone this caring, anyone this sensitive, anyone this thorough in His love will surely overlook nothing when I'm in the rough spots, when I'm in the high places of difficulty in the mountains. That's her conclusion. A lot of happens in verse 12 to 15. He talks about, uh, he affirms her in so many powerful ways. Again, I want to turn this down just a hair. Just a hair. So I can do this without, you know, blowing my ears out or you. Because that's how I ask to pass the salt at the dinner table. Pass the salt! My wife says, you've got to learn to relax. So, But I do it when I least expect it, so... It's kind of hard on sound men, so I, I apologize for always having to. So he affirms her in verse 12 to 15 in, in marvelous ways. 
He calls her in verse 12. He says, a locked garden is my sister, my bride. See, the gardens or the open fields in the land, the animals would come up and and uh, spoil the garden and spoil the water and would pollute it, the animals and the strangers and all the things. But a king had a garden that was entirely his. It was for his enjoyment. And a king had the privilege, because he had so much land and he was so wealthy, he could lock the garden, which meant none of the foreigners could come in. No strangers could come in. No animals could pollute the ground or pollute the water. And he looks at her, he says, your, go- your heart is a locked garden. You have said no to the spirit of the world. You have locked your heart and set it entirely for me. He goes, you, my bride, are a locked garden. I can see it in you. You have said no. You're not going to flirt with the spirit of the world, is, is what James calls it in James chapter 4, verse 5. Spiritual adultery. Your heart is reserved only for the Lord. You are a locked garden. Nothing can come in that will defile It's one of the great affirmations, and each of the affirmations here are powerful like that. He's just speaking this to her, and her heart is being built up and built up, and she says, I love you, and their union is coming to such a tremendous place of intimacy together. That's, by the way, chapter 4, verse 12, is a wonderful prayer. It's a prayer of consecration. Ask the Lord to make your heart a locked garden, locked from the defilement of this age, locked Say, Lord, I want my heart locked. I don't want to do a little bit of adultery, a little bit of lying, a little bit of cheating, a little bit of bitterness. I want to be a locked heart, reserved only for the pleasure of my God. Because a garden, a king's garden was built for the pleasure of the king. It wasn't a, a place to harvest wheat or to grow crops. It was a place where the king would come alone and sit and be refreshed in his own garden. And he looked at her and he says, I already see in your heart You are a locked garden. And I tell you, she is overwhelmed. Imagine God telling this to you. She isn't even fully mature yet, but He's preparing her. Well, chapter 4, verse 16. Verse 16 is really the same thing as verse 6. In verse 6, she says, I will go to the mountain. In verse 16, she brings it one step further. Verse 6 and 16 are similar in that it's her full resolution to regardless what the cost, she will embrace everything that God puts before her. And here's what she says in verse 16. She takes it a step beyond verse 6. The affirmation of being God being ravished and her being a lot guard. She says, anything you want, oh God, anything. It's the prayer of abandonment. Total abandonment. Chapter 4, verse 16. She says, awake, O north winds, and come, O south winds. Blow upon my garden. Notice, my garden. That's her heart that its spices may flow out, let my beloved come into his garden. The ownership changes right in verse 16. And I want you, Jesus, to eat the pleasant fruits, to enjoy the pleasant fruit of my heart being fully yours. The whole focus is changing from chapter from this exactly in the middle of the book. And it's now his garden that we're dealing with. And it's no longer her vineyard and her garden. It's no longer her inheritance that is her focus. It's his inheritance. She says, awake, O north winds. The north winds spoke of the cold, bitter winds of adversity. She says, send the north winds. Send the south winds of blessing. She goes, I trust you for the perfect mix the perfect combination and intensity of the the adversity of the north winds and the blessing and comfort of the south winds she says you only have the wisdom to know in every season of my life the right mix the right intensity of one versus the other typically in one season there's a north wind or there's a south wind that's the major theme of the various seasons of our life she says i'm no longer afraid of the mountain in verse six She goes, matter of fact, I'm afraid of nothing. She opens her heart. She says, anything, anything that you will send me, difficult or blessing, send it. Because the goal of my life, look at what she says, you would blow up on my garden, and oh, I love this sentence, it's spices, it's fragrance. The spice of my life would emanate to the very throne of God, and you would take possession of, And my life would be the pleasant food that you eat, Christ Jesus. Now you only pray that prayer 
when you understand verse 9 to 15. When we see the ravished heart of God, and I mean more than just a doctrine, when we a little bit feel His embrace and a little bit see the ravished heart of God, there is a realm of safety. She was like Jesus in the boat in the storm, completely asleep in confidence. She says, I am just completely just like falling back into your arms. The utter confidence, the sleep of faith. She could sleep in the storm because she says, I am the Lord's regardless. It makes no difference. It doesn't matter what it costs me. It doesn't matter what the price is. I am wholly yours, my God, because I've seen your heart for me. You are the safest place in all of existence is in full obedience to you. On the mountain, in the storm, in the boat, in the middle of a storm, asleep at at your side. And she cries out there, The great prayer of abandonment. Awake, O north wind. Come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden. Let its spices flow forth. And let me be the promise, the fulfillment of the promise your father gave to you that you would have a bride equally yoked to you. Well, he takes her serious. Chapter 5, verse 1. Very powerful. Chapter 5, verse 1. I would call that verse the jealousy of God, the ownership of God. He says nine times. He answers her. He answers that prayer and he says, okay. He says, I know that you mean it. I know that you understand. You've been to the mountain with me. I mean, you've asked to go to the mountain with the lions and the leopards in verse 6 and verse 8 of chapter 4. He goes, I understand. He goes, I know that you understand what's happening. Nine times he claims ownership. My garden. My house, my sister, it's my myrrh, it's my spice, it's my honeycomb, it's my honey, it's my wine, it's my milk that I'm eating, that I'm enjoying out of your life. Nine times he claims ownership over aspects of her life. He says, you will truly be mine. You are coming into a new season of your life. You are under the banner of the total ownership of God. And I see the potential that you would be totally mine. So I'm going to upper the ante and bring you into deep fellowship and maturity where you will join into the fellowship of sufferings at my side. He looks at her and he says, I believe you understand. I see in you the potential for full partnership. So I'm going to bring you, I'm going to invite you into the full partnership which includes the sufferings of Christ. He's going to do that to her. So there's a jealousy of God. There's that that wonderful jealousy of God. I think of the verse in James 4, 5 when it talks the Spirit of God jealously desires us. He's jealous to consume every single pocket of our lives. And then he comes in chapter 5, verse 2. And it all begins to be different now. He shows it's his sixth revelation. There's eight faces he shows in in the Song of Solomon. This is the sixth one. He shows himself as the Jesus of Gethsemane. He comes and he knocks on the door. He says, you really want the north winds and the south winds? You're really going to be exist to be my inheritance? You... Uh, having your inheritance is truly second place right now, your twofold inheritance, to be able to have intimacy and impact or to be a worshiper and a deliverer or to feel the presence of God and be anointed to touch others. You really don't mind. You're not in it for you anymore. You're really in it for me. Well, I'm going to invite you to fully embrace the cross then. I'm going to invite you to fully embrace the cross and live like I live as a bondservant to my Father. Because up until now, Well, especially in chapter 2 when she was enjoying the Lord. Jesus was a means to her ends. And that's okay. In chapter 2 when she was at at the table delighting, she just was said, Oh, it's it's such delight in His presence. His fruit is sweet to my taste. Oh, I love it, I love it. Jesus says in verse 7 of chapter 2, He says, Don't disturb her. I want her right here. She doesn't know it. She is self-absorbed. And she's only enjoying me because she sees me as the way to make her happy. She doesn't even know who she is, really. She, I'm a means to her end. And he says, that's okay. That's okay for a beginner. That's totally okay. But one day, she's going to forget herself and ascend to the place of a mature partner with no regard for herself. Like I said to my father, not my will, but your will, O God. And her food will be to do the will of God like my food. And we will enjoy our banquet together, doing the will of God regardless what it costs us. He's inviting her to the cross. 
Jesus is going to be the end of her life, the goal of her life, and not just the means to the end of, of happiness. He Himself will be her all in all. That's what's going on in chapter 5. So He comes again. Verse 2. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks. He says, open to me, my sister, my bride, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with the dew, my hair with the drops of the night. Jesus is coming. His hair is drenched in the dew because He's been up all night in the garden alone. He's been in the dark night. He has the dew of the night is drenching His hair. He's coming as the one that has been, who has endured the dark night all by Himself. It's the Jesus of the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, you want full partnership? You want to live before my God like I live before Him? Where absolutely nothing is negotiable except the will of God? She says, yes. I want my life to be your garden. He says, okay, come with me then. Come with me. He's going to challenge her to the very core of her being. He's going to prove to her, not to her, but He's going to prove it. It's going to be manifest. She is in it for Him and not for her any longer. It's, it's, it's good to enjoy the blessing of God because she wants the south winds. I'm not talking about some morbid asceticism. I'm talking about a settled resolution that cost is irrelevant. See, people that are wealthy don't look at price tags. And when we're wealthy in love, the cost is irrelevant. There's only one thing we live for to do the will of God. It's our food. It's the food that Jesus eats. It's what makes His family and His marriage and His city so abundantly full of light and righteousness and joy. He will have a bride equally yoked to Him. It starts off, she goes, I sleep, but my heart is awake. When she says I sleep, she's talking about the rest of faith of verse 16. She goes, I'm so confident that I will take the north or the south. I could sleep in the boat in the midst of a storm. I am totally resolute that I'm yours. So she's sleeping in the confidence of faith. But she says, my heart is awake. I am alert to spiritual things. I can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm fully awake. I'm not dull of spirit. I'm, I'm fully awake, fully alert in the Holy Spirit. But completely at rest. I don't care what happens anymore. She says, it's the voice of my beloved. He's knocking. When the Lord knocks... It's that divine initiative. He's about to open up a new dimension for her. He's going to invite her into a new experience. The Lord knocked on the door of the Laodiceans in, in uh, Revelation 3.20. He knocked at the door. He was wanting a new entry into the life of the Laodiceans. He's knocking. And I believe the Lord is going to be knocking and inviting the end time church into this kind of partnership with Himself. But they will never ever, the end time church will never be able to do chapter 5 without a deep foundation in chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Right now the church faces their failure and they quit. Or they look at the fear or the, and they quit. They have no, almost so little understanding of the truth of who our heavenly bridegroom is. We're stuck in chapter 1 and chapter 2. I don't say that as a rebuke or a complaint. He is sufficient. He will get us to the end of the book. I'm just saying that I believe He's going to upper the ante. He's going to begin to cherish us. He's going to begin to reveal His heart in a new way. I believe of, of the many faces that God reveals of Himself in the Scripture, the most, the two most vital ones in this hour, the two most significant, is the face of God the Father as a tender Father. The face of God as a tender Father and the face of Jesus as the heavenly Bridegroom, the passionate Bridegroom. Between the tender father and the passionate bridegroom, we're going to be equipped for chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to be releasing songs. There's going to be releasing tremendous revelation on those two things. The tender father, who knows how to discipline us in tenderness and embrace us when we fail, and the passionate bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. That's what I believe is key in this hour. So he knocks at the door. He's inviting her into a new dimension of experience with Him. When He knocks, He's saying there's something new, something fresh I'm going to give you. And He calls her this, my perfect one. He says, my perfect. He affirms her in chapter 5, verse 2, because she said in chapter 4, 16, I want everything. He says, you are my perfect one. It's the same affirmation He gave after verse 6. Remember verse 6? 
When she said, chapter 4, verse 6, she said, I'll go to the mountain of myrrh. He says, there is no blemish in you at all. There's no spot in you. She says the same thing again in verse 16. I'll go fully. I want the north and the south winds. Well, he comes and says the same thing. You are perfect. There's no spot in you. He says, you are fully consecrated to me to the best that you can give me. And now the rest is my power to enable you to actually walk out what you have decided in your heart. The Lord is much more concerned with the intention of our heart than our attainment because He knows He can empower us to do the attainment. It's we hold the lock of our heart to whether we're going to set our heart to do His will. That's the struggle right there. He comes and He knocks. He says, my dove. Remember the dove, the single-minded one. The one that's loyal. The one that is sensitive to the Holy Spirit, not quenching the Holy Spirit, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. My perfect one, my mature one. He says, come with me into the Garden of Gethsemane. Come with me and let's see if you will stay true to me regardless what it costs you. If it really is your food to do the will of God. Of course, he already knows the answer. Verse 3 to 5, she responds in instant obedience. Instant obedience. Because he tells her to arise. He tells her to arise and to come with him, to open the door. Verse 3, she says, I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them again? My beloved put his hand on the lock of the door of my heart, she's saying. My heart is yearning for him. I arose. She instantly arises to open for my beloved to his knock. My hands drip with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock of my heart. Now again, we're talking in the poetic language of love here. What happens is she starts up immediately. She, she makes a case for her instant obedience. She says, I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? She's not saying it's too inconvenient to get out of bed like half the commentators say. That's not what she's saying. She says, my robes are as filthy rags before you. She says, I've done it my way before. My robes do not stand in the presence of God. I am wearing your robes. I've taken my robes off. I will never do it my way again. Like when you challenged me in chapter 1 and chapter 2, I fell into shame and I fell to, to fear. I am not going to do it my way this time. My robes, I will never put them on again. I will wear your robes because my robes are as filthy garments in the presence of God. Secondly, she says, I have washed my feet. I won't dirty them again. How can I get my feet dirty? You've cleansed me. I can't go my way. I will not refuse you this time. Again, half the commentators read this exactly opposite. They think at this season, she is denying him the third time. The first time in chapter 1, the second time in chapter 217, and the third time here. I don't believe that at all. I believe he has just called her in verse 2, my perfect one, my dove. He's answering the cry that he would be her, that she would be his full inheritance. And if you know the end of the story, you know that she is completely in obedience by the way that he responds to her. It's a very powerful thing happening. She says in verse four, my heart yearns for you. And I arose. She instantly arises. There's no delay in her obedience. He knocked. She arises and goes right to the door. But listen to what happens at the door. She goes, my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. Now, we're talking about the lock of her heart. Jesus coming with myrrh, drenched in myrrh. She says, I'm saying yes to the cross. I will unlock the secret place of my heart and there's myrrh dripping all over everything I'm doing on my hand and on my heart. She says, on my works, my hand, and on my heart. The two issues that she cares about is being drawn and running. Intimacy and impact. She goes, my heart and my hands I have said yes to myrrh. I've said yes to the cross. Whether you touch my outward deeds, the work of my hands, or whether you touch my inward condition of heart, I am yours. I have said yes. And myrrh, by the grace of God, is dripping. You've empowered me by your embrace to say yes to the cross. So the hand and the heart, the external and the internal, her works and her devotion, everything is on the line here. Verse 6 and 7, the ultimate twofold test right here. Verse 6, I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. 
And number two, the watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took my covering away from me. They took my veil away from me. What's happening? The Lord is uh, is testing her according to her twofold inheritance. The two things she cares most about. Number one, the presence of God. And number two, her ability to impact others. What happens in verse 6? The presence of God is lifted from her life. Because remember in chapter 2, when it was sweet, man, she was in it. The Lord says, will you be in it when you feel nothing? Are you in it for me or are you still in it for you? He says, I'm going to lift my presence and I want to see if you will stand and be mine because the focus of your heart is to be mine, not to enjoy the things of the Spirit right now. It's to be wholly mine. That's the issue I'm dealing with. I'm coming as the garden, the Jesus of Gethsemane. I'm sending the north winds. I'm preparing you to be my possession. Will you be mine when all of the presence of God, the feeling of the presence of God, I'm only talking about, God never leaves her. And we find in chapter 6, He never left her. He was ravished over her as He was watching her stand true in this test. And then the watchmen, the leaders in the body of Christ, the authorities, they struck her. She loses her place in the body of Christ. So now she has no ministry. And she has no enjoyment of God's presence. She doesn't feel intimacy. And she has no place of impact. They, they struck her. They wounded her in the house of God. They took her covering away. And which is all but saying, you're kicked out. You are censored. You cannot do the thing that God has put in your heart in this place. And she's standing there in just pure, raw, naked faith. The presence of God she cannot feel. Internally, her heart feels cold externally, it's difficult circumstances. Internally, the intimacy, she can't touch it. Externally, the impact, she's kicked out of her place in the body of Christ. So whether it's intimacy and impact, or whether it's just internal issues of the heart and the external issues of circumstances, God dealt with both of them at the most severe level in her life. He touched both of them for just a moment. The mystics in the 12 and 13 and 14th century called this the dark night of the soul. The time where in total obedience, the presence of God was withdrawn, the discernible presence, not out of anger, not out of discipline, but to draw her heart forth in mature love. He left to draw her into deeper maturity. That was a doctrine that the mystics had in, in, the, in the Middle Ages. The Catholic mystics. The Protestants... The doctrine of the Protestants is much more like the friends of Job. If there's trouble, you're, you've done sin. They have no, the Protestants have no clear doctrine for having trouble with God because you were righteous. It's exactly the opposite. Joseph's in the dungeon because he's called. David's in the wilderness because he's called by God, not because he's rebelling against God. Job has boils all over his body and lost everything. Why? Because he was the most righteous man on the earth, the only man that God could trust. It's exactly the opposite, but Job's friends would be good Protestants. You got trouble, you're in sin. Easy equation, but it's not the equation of the Word of God. The Catholics saw this point very clearly. It's the dark night of the soul. She stands naked faith before God. Her inheritance to feel, to enjoy intimacy, to be anointed for impact, both of them are gone. What do you do as a person that has committed your heart to Jesus Christ and there's no feeling of God whatsoever? And everything that He promised you is drying up in front of your hands. This will happen in every single one of your lives in various ways in a couple key seasons throughout your life. I'm not trying to make you afraid and say, Job, all your family's going to die and all that. I don't believe that. But God knows how to touch external circumstances and the internal condition of the heart to see what you will do naked with absolutely no evidence of the things He has promised happening in your life. Where do you stand in that hour? For every one of you on the journey to holy passion will stand in that place several times in your journey on the earth. I don't mean every day and every season, but just a couple of strategic times in your life He will draw you forth to embrace the cross more fully. Her response, verse 8, 
As I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell him I'm lovesick. She's not compromising here. She goes to the, listen to this, the carnal members of the body of Christ because the elders have kicked her out. She goes to them and she says, maybe you know something I don't know. Maybe you can help me find him. The humility is staggering. She's so much more mature than they are. She says, I want your help. If you find him, tell him I'm not upset at all. I'm not back in chapter 2. Tell him that I'm lovesick. I'm not offended at all. Jesus looked at them in Matthew chapter 11. And he knew that John the Baptist was about to die. And the two or three messengers came from John the Baptist. And I have a very a different interpretation that is the standard one of that event. John the Baptist is in prison, and John the Baptist knows he's going to die. He knows what's happening. He's already declared it. I must decrease. He must increase. My ministry is over. He knows that he's going to die soon, and he's going to enter into his eternal inheritance at the throne of God, and he wants to be at the throne of God. He sends his messengers because he's taught his messengers about the messianic promises. So they all go accompany, go to Jesus, and they say, John wants to know. Of course, Jesus knows what's in the heart of John. He knows that John already knows who he is. He looks and he says, that's good, John. That's good shepherding. You want your disciples to know firsthand who I am because they were not exposed to Jesus. He goes, come over here. He raises a few people from the dead, heals the people. He quotes the famous messianic passage of Isaiah 61. And they said, Wow, everyone knows Isaiah 61. That's the Every little Jewish boy at Bar Mitzvah knew Isaiah 61 as the Messiah. He does Isaiah 61. He says, do you get the message? And they, they're going back going, awesome! And But Jesus gives them one little statement. He says in Matthew 11, in this passage, he goes, verse 6. He says, but one thing, blessed are those who do not stumble over me. They said, well, okay. Why would we stumble over you? You are raising the dead, etc. They go back to John. John says, what happened? He says, he did Isaiah 61. And, Jesus, and John said in his heart, I knew he would do that. I knew he would do that. They said, he's the one, John. He's going to get you out of prison. It's going to be great. He is the one. Well, I mean, we've seen it with our own eyes. And John, as a good shepherd, says, good. I've now led you faithfully to him. He says, did he say anything else? He says, well, some little proverb we didn't understand. What would he say? Didn't really make sense because with all the miracles, he said, well, what did he say? He said, well, blessed are they that do not stumble over me. We stumble over God in two ways. We stumble over God by what he does. But far more, far more, we stumble over God because of what he doesn't do. He was not ever intending to deliver John. And when John died, that host of disciples were going to be so confused. If you are the Messiah, why did he die? And Jesus could go to them and says, remember the proverb I gave you. I am he. But I was never intending to deliver him. He had to decrease. He came only for me. Don't stumble over what I will not do. I am not going to deliver him. And I believe that John was pastoring his disciples, not doubting Jesus. I mean, John... I mean, what do you want to do? Go pray and fast in the wilderness for five more years? I mean, he was going to go into the eternal city. I mean, he wasn't like getting out of his home to some, I mean, getting out of prison to some plush, plush home somewhere, you know, in his three cars. He was going out to fast in the wilderness with locusts and honey. His heart was to see the bridegroom established. He was called the friend of the bridegroom. John 3, 29. He says, I am the friend of the bridegroom. I announce the bridegroom's coming. That's how he saw himself. Well, the point is this. She's not offended. Jesus has not protected her in this hour. She's been kicked out of the body and he is not putting his presence on her. She is standing there and she's not offended at all and he's not doing what he's supposed to do, but she's not offended. She says in verse 8, I am lovesick. I am lovesick. If you find him, tell him this. I love him with all of my heart. I meant what I said in chapter 4, verse 16. My life is to have, is to be his garden and the spices that come out of my life will be a pleasant food for him. And that's all that I care about at this season of my life. And the, the daughters ask her a question in verse nine. They said, what is your beloved more than another that you would so charge us to find him? These are other members of the body. He says, we don't understand what you see. 
You're kicked out of the body and we, everyone knows that's the passion of your heart. You got all these promises and you're completely cut off from them seemingly. Everybody knows you love him, but he won't show himself to you. Who is he? What this hold that he has on you? What is it that you see that we don't see in him? What is your beloved? They ask him that you want us to find him. We would leave him if he did this to us. But you're lovesick. And she gives in chapter 5, verse 10 to 16, what I believe the greatest statement of worship and love in the Word of God. Again, it's spoken in poetic language. And we're not going to develop it because it's, it's too uh, in-depth to do that. But she says, who is he? I'll tell you who he is. Verse 10, she says, my beloved is radiant and ruddy. He's chief among 10,000 which means he's the most distinguished of all. That's what that means. There's lots of things that, that those phrases mean. She starts off with a general statement of verse 10. He is The word is white in the New King James. My beloved is white. The Hebrew word, which you find in other versions, he's radiant, the NIV says. He's brilliant, the New American Standard says. He's dazzling, several other versions say. There's a splendor that is in him. He is dazzling. He's outstanding amongst all the people of the earth. There's none like him. And she goes on and gives ten character attributes of him. His head, his hair, his eyes, his cheeks, his lips, his hands, his body, his legs, his countenance. And verse 16, she ends the tenth one and she says, His mouth is most sweet. The kisses of his mouth. I've known intimacy with him. She says, even the remembrance of intimacy with Him is most sweet to me. She says, I will never draw back on Him. Look at verse 16. Yes, He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend. They are overwhelmed. They're like, wow. And in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 1, they change the question. Remember the question they asked in chapter 5, verse 9? Where, what is he? Chapter 6, verse 1. They don't say, what is he? They said, where is he? We want to seek him with you. We want to find the one you know. She communicated the loveliness of Christ Jesus. And again, there, I don't think there's a statement in the Word of God more powerful than that statement right there. And then she says some more things, and then suddenly, Suddenly, the Lord breaks the silence. Go ahead, I'm going to have you come on up now. Just prepare. Suddenly, the Lord breaks the silence. He's left her. He allowed her to be kicked out of the body. The Lord speaks up. He says, what do you think the Lord would say His first word always? Oh, my love. Twelve times He speaks. Twelve times He begins with my love and my beautiful one. He says, you are as beautiful as Tirzah. One of the most beautiful cities of Israel. And I don't want to go, go off and describe Tirzah. But it means tremendously beautiful. That's enough for now. He says, you are as lovely as Jerusalem. He says, you are as awesome. Or the NIV says, you are as majestic as an army with banners. Again, as we said earlier, the army with banners came home from war, victorious. And when they walked with banners in the procession down the street, they defeated the enemy. He looks at her, he says, you have totally defeated the enemies in your heart. He says, other people have written you off, but I saw your prayer in chapter 4, verse 16. You stayed true to me. When my presence lifted in verse 6, and when circumstances were very difficult, when I brought you into the dark night of the soul, when you embraced the cross, verse 8 of chapter 5, you were lovesick and you were not offended. You were still mine regardless what it costed you. And the statement of worship she gave in chapter 5, verse 10 to 16, He is dazzling. He's outstanding among 10,000. His mouth is most sweet. Even the remembrance of my intimacy with Him is enough to hold me steady in the time of the dark night. This is my lover. This is my friend. He is all together lovely. Chapter 5, verse 16. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. 
For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.